got Arnold here again, and we're going to talk more about the settlement. Okay. I was told I should speak a little bit more about the education I had and uh, my love life. <laughs> that will be a short chapter. I better go get the whip. <laughs> How's that? No. <laughs> well, starting with my education, I did not have preschool. I didn't have kindergarten because there was none. <laughs> I started in the first grade, went through eighth grades. We had uh, public school, eight grades out in the country. Quite a few, we did talked about that last week a little bit. There were different districts and within the countryside. And, and uh, I went to Union School, which was two and a half miles from our house. And uh, we provided our own transportation. Uh, some of us walked the first two or three years uh, but not only in the evening. In the morning we were taken. Our parents were good in that way. And after about three or four years, another neighbor moved in and Clarence Schritter and I, we drove our cars. And so we, we pooled cars, in other words. I would drive one week and he would drive his parents' car the next week. And uh, we rode horses some, not too much. But uh, after the eighth grade, I didn't continue to high school right away. I stayed out one year. Uh, the grandparents were living out here in the country yet. My parents and Leland's parents were in town in the winter time at least. And so dad decided maybe the grandparents should live in town. And we tore down part of an old granary and uh, uh, we started, we built a little house for grandpa. So I didn't go to school right after high school. After one year, I had decided to go to Yankton to our church college and I was going to perhaps be a pastor. Uh, Herbert Shaw left with me, and myself, and my sister Viola. She, we all three entered college up at Yankton, South Dakota. My, my sister had in mind becoming a, a teacher, and that's what she did. And she was a grade school teacher for her life's work. Herbert went, continued in college. He went into the pastorate. But after two years, I didn't think I would be good pastor material. I just didn't feel at home at it. And so uh, I dropped out. And during that time, I had been exempt from, from the draft. I would have gotten into the Korean War but because I was exempt, I, I, uh, I didn't have to go to Korea. But I had to, I declared that I was no longer going to college. And it took about a year and then I was drafted into the service. And so that is, we, we did bit, build that little house for our grandparents. And it wasn't quite finished when I left, but uh, I went into the service my two years. I was stationed over at, in Germany. And when I came back, I, uh, I uh, am I getting ahead of myself? Do you want to talk about the... Yes, I went to the Germany. Army after, after those two years in Yankton. And then when I came back from the service, I, I continued in college here at, uh, at Fort Collins. And uh, I went into the field of agronomy. <laughs> I studied for agronomy, but when I was finished, 
I didn't continue in it. My dad had a way of <laughs> changing my mind in that he and his brother Leland's dad had started building a house for Jake Shaw. He thought his brother-in-laws had to do that, but they, with farming, they couldn't continue it. And so my dad again kind of sidetracked me and Paul Nodal and I built Jake Scholl's house. And then by that time, Ted wanted a house built and, and uh, Paul helped me start a house for Ted. But he went off to college, I was through college, and he went off to college and it was up to me f to finish Ted's house. And so I never, I never did work in the field of agronomy except one summer before I actually Tell us what agronomy is. I don't even Pardon? know what that. What is that? What is agronomy? Agronomy? That is a study of agriculture. Oh, okay. And what may go with it. <laughs> okay. uh, I would have been in the co soil conservation part of it. That was my plan, like Kenneth Dobler was later. But anyway, uh, that was the extent of my education and then by that time so you were in the service in the 50s right 54 to 56 so you were after and I bypassed the... I didn't have to go to the Korean War and my MOS military occupational status uh, was that I'm pretty good at mechanics and so I was aircraft mechanic okay. over in Europe for about a year and a half after after basic training and all of my training went a year and a half and then I was had my two year obligation in. And then by that time uh, I thought I maybe would like just to, to farm how I grew up. <laughs> 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 uh, that was my goal. But I got sidetracked again. <laughs> I did, I did buy a half a section of the ground, and I, I did do the farming. But Bethune School was short of a teacher. I finished out one year because the teacher had died, and then uh, for three years I taught school. Uh, well, I farmed then, but again I was sidetracked, and uh, I. I taught school for three years because they couldn't, teachers were hard to get and were hard to, positions were hard to follow. And so I taught three years in Bethune. I taught the math and the sciences and because I knew German, I, I taught German for a year or two. And then I finally started farming. And uh, when I finished my last year of school at Fort Collins, I got a letter from a girl that had gone to school with my sister here in Burlington, only for one year. Her name was Jean Davis. She had been engaged, but she, she uh, wrote me a letter. She, was, she had broken off the engagement and she was kind of at a loss. Well, I had kind of liked the girl. She came home with Viola once in a while. And so that one summer we dated quite a bit. Pretty steady, really. But then at the beginning, my last year of school in, yeah, in Fort Collins, she got back with her old boyfriend and they got married. And she kind of put me on hold a little bit. She, <laughs> she, she said I shouldn't get serious. Well, I kind of bided by her word. But he came back or pursued her again. And so they got married. And so I never, I never went with anyone again in a serious manner, at least. So that's the end of that story. And I. I spent my life farming and building houses, I guess. Somewhere in between there, Leland and I, we, 
tore down two, two barracks for the lumber. They were big two-story barracks, 30 by 90, and uh, out of each one we salvaged, I think, 30,000 feet, I think, board feet. Well, so this lumber was all piled up, stored up. So in the meantime, I built, we built a big cattle shed on dad's farm and, and uh, built on to the existing house. We used up a lot of the lumber, but a little bit of it is still stacked up. Really? Not, not a whole lot, but mm. Leland did the same with their lumber. They built onto the house and so I think on a cattle shed, increased the shed. And I don't know how much lumber he has left, but a little bit probably. Yeah, so. I used a lot of that lumber. You know, that's a lot of lumber to use up. <laughs> and that but was, it was a lot of two by twelves. I was and, say good lumber. Good lumber. And uh, so it was used in various, mostly for floor joists. That big cattle shed we built it. We used a lot of two by twelves and and uh, well, a lot of the sheeting lumber and stuff. That was a, a hundred and twenty long by by uh, thirty deep, I think. Open, open on the front end, but not completely open. I heard stories about cattle sheds being picked up by the wind, so I put a short roof on the front and that kind of broke the wind. We've never had any trouble with that part. So that's kind of the end of my story. Where were those barracks? Where were the barracks positioned? Oh, the you... barracks had been in Fort Carson, down by Pueblo, south of Colorado Springs. So you went there? Yeah, we tore down there. It was a 90-day project. We had a deadline. And we met it, we met it. We had uh, one boy here from the settlement help us, George Graham, help Emil and I. And the families got involved a little bit now and then. Leland kind of helped finish up the final day or two. I was in the military at the time, but I just come home for like a, yeah, that, a 10 day leave. And so I just got in on the tail of it. And they, cause they, they were supposed to clean the grounds up, nails and, whatever, you know, and it had snowed, you know, and so it's pretty tough to kind of see what you're doing. And so I, I rigged up a magnet on a, on a pitchfork, you know, we was raking that through the snow there to pick up nails yet, you know. I think and, those were the cleanest grounds that <laughs> some people didn't clean up that coin. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, they, they did most of the work. I just got in on the little details at the end pretty much. It was a, it was a fun project, but uh, when Emil and I would go up, we would we would tear down a certain amount of lumber and bring it home on a Friday night with the, both trucks. And but at the beginning, you know, you you do a lot of preliminary work, and we didn't get enough salvage to come home every week with a truck. Some so some day some weeks we went up just with a car that way. That's the end of that. I, I want to I want to make one correction on I think it's a correction on the settlement, where the settlement really was, the German settlement. I made the statement in one of the interviews where I indicated that the settlement was the center of it was more northeast of our church. But after kind of rethinking it, I think I have to say, see, they used to say in at the settlement, which was which meant east of here, northeast, northeast. But the, there was a lot of German settlement all directions. I think actually I can say that the two churches are both pretty much in the in the center of the settlement because there were Adolf south of us yet, almost, there were two Stolliker families almost out by the Zieglers. There was 
there was shawls that had moved from up here. They had settled in more on the four mile road. I think I have to conclude that the German settlement is actually centered right at the two churches. I think that would describe it the best. There were Bowers, there were Bowders, there were Weishars, there were uh, Slickemeyers. They weren't all German Russians. They didn't come by way of Russia. There was a Stoltz family that came from Nebraska to here because they had come directly from Germany to Nebraska. But you know, people resettle and so they came into this settlement. And they talked more of a high German rather than the Schwabish dialect. Well, there was Nodals too. And the Nodals, <coughs> name off a few more, I can't just think of them just all. Just think of this thought of that uh, one. There were, there were uh, Adolfs that were right here next to the church. That was a, an Adolf homestead. There was one of his sons lived one mile north. That was Andrew. There was William about two miles west. And there was another Adolf brother south of <coughs> my, where, my, where I lived. And so uh, the, the settlement was all around the churches. I mean, they used to always talk of settlement being kind of northeast of here, but that was kind of a misnomer too. I just wanted to add that. So it was never really a town. It was everybody was separated by some yes, number of every, miles. So, yeah. but it was the German. Each lived on their places. Yeah. Right. No source of groceries, grocery store, or something like that. No, Bethune was the closest. Okay. And Bethune used to be quite a town. It it had grocery store. It had a dry goods store. <laughs> several bank. stores, I guess. Had a bank there. Had a bank. Wasn't there a little store? I think that's kind of the end of my... Well, she's talking, there was a store... Over here where... Oh, Yale. Yale. Oh, Yale. There was a Yale, Yale post office here. And uh, the mail was brought out of Bethune. Uh, uh, Roy Smith was a mail carrier for when I was growing up, <laughs> before that, Ed Stoliker here down on the next place, south, he uh, he brought the mail out and carried it. He was a substitute carrier. Uh, but Roy Smith was the main carrier while I was growing up. Would the Grams have been in part of this too? Yes, the Grams came. They lived north of the church. Uh, they, however, didn't homestead here right away. Mr. Graham worked for for the ranch. Uh, Cox? Cox Ranch. Cox Ranch. And uh, it took a few years until, until he homesteaded the Graham place. And then Valda lived on a, actually a Dober place. I think uh, John Dober had, yeah. uh, they had built up the, the first little house, I think. And uh, then the Dobers kind of migrated southeast and bought a half section where Ted lived, but John also bought the land where he built on then too. So it changed a little with time. The Shawls all used to be a mile north of the church. Uh, one, two, three, four. But every one of those, except the one, the widow family, which was Carolina Shaw, <coughs> her husband had died in Russia, but they, she stayed on that place along with one of her sons, I think, two sons, Traugut Shaw. Oh, by the way, Traugut, that name means trust God. Mm. Gottlob is praise God. Gottfried 
is uh, freedom of God. Their names were uh, biblically uh, based, most names. Not all, but a lot of them. Johannes became Jonas. My uncle was called Jonas, but his name was Johannes, which is John. And uh, Bill Dobler was the first one that got some education above eighth grade. He went to Fort Collins, and he he actually was a teacher first. He came back, he taught school, one of the small schools for a couple of years, and then he got into a government job, I think. Well, uh, he taught school during in the, Sugar City. Pardon? He taught school in Sugar City for a couple of years. Where? Bill, Sugar Sugar City. I think that's right. Yeah, he taught school so. down there a couple of years. And then Walter Dober, he went into the ministry. Well, that, it was a requirement that he go to a seminary, which we had a seminary in Yankton. That's why I started at Yankton when I did, and Herbert Shaw went in, and he, he spent his time in the ministry, plus being a missionary down in South America for about 12 years, I think. And you've talked about some of the equipment, but we can talk about some of the dangers because most of our farmers don't lose a digit. How did you lose your finger? Well, that's kind of stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Do things that you know you shouldn't, but, uh, well, you just do it. And, uh, yeah, uh, farm, farm work is, is dangerous, it can be. You work with a lot of power machinery and stuff. Oh, the size of farms. When I was growing up, we got a new tractor. It was a two, three plow tractor. Two, three plow to three, four plow was kind of the standard tra tractors. And uh, we could Do you remember what it cost? Pardon? Do you remember what it cost? The first oh, tractor? Oh, yes, I think. Uh, $30? <laughs> no, not that cheap. <laughs> I think our first tractor cost about 1070 oh, okay. It comes to mind now, 1070 Okay. And they, it was a case, a little case. Leland's dad bought a, the next size bigger the year before. You're not still using it, are you, Leland? But <laughs> they, they almost bought two H internationals. It was just a matter of, I don't know, a few dollars and what the, how the dealers presented it, I think. And uh, they, at that time, had had two tractors, however, uh, both on steel, one. So, so are these the tractors we see rusting in a lot of the fields when we see these tractors that yeah. are, these are those. Those are early, early tractors. Yeah, those were earlier tractors. Okay. Uh, uh, tractors were cumbersome. They didn't have turning brakes, they, uh, which was not good, you know. You had to make a figure eight on the end of the field <laughs> with your lister because you couldn't turn short. Uh, and so you had a guide, and that was... Heavy work. I mean, farming was heavy work. The Dobers had hard power because the hard power dealer got to them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think John Dober, the grandpa, had a 1220 used one, 1224. And the big hard power was an 1836. That means 18 horses on the field. Uh, 36 horses on the belt when they'd belt them up to a threshing machine. But the manual part of farming has decreased considerably, correct? Pardon? The manual part of farming has decreased considerably. Oh, yes. Yeah, it used to be. It was a lot of, a lot of handwork. 
A lot of fork work, a lot of scoop work. My dad said 50 bushels of wheat onto a wagon. You know, they did that with one scooping. They prided themselves, like playing basketball or something. They prided themselves on filling the wagon without stuffing. Well, then later we got a 150 bushel truck and uh, you couldn't do that no more. <laughs> you had to rest a few times. And they scooped it out of, you know how Leland's granary is. Yeah. There was a driveway went through the center with bins on each side, but you, uh, you scooped into the truck from the bin. The truck was in the driveway. So this is post thrashing then. This is the actual grain. Pardon? This would be post thrashed. This would be the yes. wheat. Seed. It was thrashed by the big okay. thrash machines that would move through the community. And uh, it took six men on the thrashing machine to toss. It was, it was not bundles. This was headed. It was stacked loose. And it took six, uh, six men to keep the thrash machine running. And it was, if you had granaries at home, you uh, hauled it home and stored it until winter time. Prices were usually better in winter time. Everybody had some grain storage. I think the Strobels had, for that time, had a good system. Uh, there was another granary built west of our place that we later tore down for that used lumber stuff. But it was a smaller granary and a narrower driveway. Well, you, you know, then later on, the eight foot driveway was too narrow because your trucks were eight foot wide. And so the thing progressed as time went you know, When did combines come in? Our first combine was, we were a little bit latecomers. We, we headed yet in 1942, that was our last year of heading. The Dobers, the same way, they still headed. <clears throat> and then after that, everyone started buying used combines. combines. Okay. And uh, that put away with the thrash, with right. the thrash machine. However, uh, we still bundled some. The Zaglers had a smaller thrashing machine. They thrashed for us. Uh, our Dober had a thrash, smaller thrashing machine. He thrashed some for, for custom work, some. I'm getting off base no, here. I don't know. No, why. no, you're on, on base for us, so. But I think we're, we're good unless there's one more question. I was going to ask you, how did you come about knowing those barracks were oh, okay. to be torn down? I knew they were being torn down because my brother, youngest brother, Roland, after his basic, which was down at Fort Riley, uh, Kansas, he was sent to Fort Carson. What was he in? Communications, wasn't he? Yeah, I 